California Youth Authority was the place. At this time, for those that hadn't seen the parts before, I had gone, um, grown up on the east side of South Central, witnessed my father's death in 1990, relocated to Inglewood, California, started gang banging. At the time in 1994, I was involved in a high profile shooting in Hollywood, which at this time in 96, I still yet to be arrested for. So keep that in mind. I've always had that sitting in the back. I'm on the run, but not on the run. I know there's a crime out there and people who have been caught that have something to gain by implicating me in that crime. So that played a part in my mentality in 1996. Frank Lewis talks about the prospect of Lisa attending his parole hearing. Boy, are going to look at what I did, and they're going to be like, oh, man, this is what he done done. And they're going to really see the impact of my crime. For four years, she attended his parole hearing, telling the board, I live every day in a prison far worse than he ever will. Parole for me is next to impossible. Over time, Lisa grew stronger. I'm disabled. I'm not brain dead. Despite enormous daily obstacles, she went back to USC to finish her degree. If Lisa could overcome her challenges, could Frank Lewis overcome his? I had hope. I really did. How you doing tonight, Frank? Greetings, greetings. I'm fine, blessed, and highly favored like always, and a pleasure to be here. Once again, I got to give a thanks to Jason and Mark for allowing me to have this position on their platform. And, yeah. Back to 1996, you guys. At the time, due to my gang membership, my learned behavior and criminal activities, most rap artists to me were known by the song and not the name. So I was aware of I Get Around, Dear Mama, but at 14 years old and a gang member, knowing that Tupac Shakur was the artist was not in my replica. 1996, California Youth Authority location was Fred C. Nellis. This is a juvenile facility that houses youth from the age of 10 to 17, no, 10 to 19 normally. In, in 1996, it was definitely that age range, 10 to 19 year olds. High gang, bravado, egos, and quest to earn reputations. Compton Pyrus was who we would say Tupac got out of prison at the age of 25 and joined. And there were many of those members in the California Youth Authority facility I was in, as well as their rivals. Death to Tupac occurs. I remember that day, it's like 9-11, here in Vegas, October the 1st. Like I was saying, on the day he died, I remember sitting down and hearing them play multiple Tupac songs. Uh, Turtle from First Street East Coast had a little radio they let him bring to the little rec yard there. Another event, like Tupac was an event that affected us all. We can all relate to that. But also in this same year, 1996, in the California Youth Authority, they suffered the first, with a correctional officer murder. And it was a, a black woman named Eunice Baker. This is a murder. This is what I thought didn't happen here. And when I got up there, I learned more about the story. But what we were getting is she was missing. But they don't want to tell us why. We don't got TV, cell phone, none of that. There's a female Black staff member missing. She was a mother figure. She wanted rehabilitation to mean what it was instead of what most other correctional officers was either hit the gate, do they ate and hit the gate, or looking for a financial benefit there as far as selling drugs, uh, cigarettes, and weapons. So she was going to be a whistleblower. And the staff actually arranged for her death. They went to the Bloods first. And uh, Crips, nah, uh 
So what they ended up doing was going to the Southsiders and they gave them what we call a, um, a white Southsider to know that a, a staff member could walk down the hallway and disappear. There was no cameras at the time. So what happened is he took her to a laundry room. The staff already arranged for it to happen. So everybody turned their heads. He then raped her, put her in a laundry basket, took her out to the trash, put her in the trash can. So it took them three days to figure this out. Damn. That, that was deep. I wasn't there personally with her, but oh, I when see. I got to that institution, there were several inmates still there. So I know it is like if I was there, yeah, she was yeah. a very, very nurturing, nurturing. And by the book, though, there's some female staff that are up there known for giving away their personal stuff, you know, sex and contraband. But she was known for trying to change us. So that really was a hit to me, not even being there. But when I learned her character, like, damn, she could have probably changed a whole lot more lives if she would have lived. Yeah, because she really cared. Integrity. Yeah. But when they found her, which we were still on lockdown. This was a two-week lockdown on our bed. The only thing we got to do is go to shower, come back to the bed. All 13 locations were locked down for two weeks? Yes. Yes. Wow. Remember, um, now, after this happened, they had to come up with an emergency, what they called an emergency mandate. They wanted to remove all uh, adult convictions from the youth authority. So all the inmates that were charged as adults with life sentences, not even if you didn't even have a life, there were some people there with short sentences, but were tried as adults based on their age and got the opportunity to come here to avoid being more criminalized was their goal. Keep them here. Hopefully we'll send them there with a better mentality to change how prison works. But no, what they did is they shifted prison by sending all these people at one time. So they kept everybody on lockdown while they figured out how to rebalance the numbers because everything worked by a ratio, how many staff compared to inmates. So they needed to lock it down and reform. It was called the uh, uh, structural reform of the youth authority. They moved everybody. That Whoa. sent me from Whittier to uh, Paso Robles. So now I'm going from an institution in the middle of the city, Los Angeles, where my mom could jump on a, a regular $1.25 bus and come see me to this institution that is a four hour drive, a six and a half hour bus ride on a Greyhound that's 45 bucks then for my mom. And not to get too deep into it, but how was your mother doing at that time with you being locked up? Was was she, because you mentioned before that she was into the drugs deep and everything, was she starting to, to rehabilitate herself a bit or was she still into that? Before I started my youth authority stint, she went to prison. So I was in a group home in 1991. She went to prison. At this time in 1996, she was doing the transporting for back and forth from Tijuana. Oh. Yeah, so she's in the game now, which yeah. she did before in the 80s and the 70s, like the late 70s and the early 80s as well. She returned back to the game that she knew based on when she came home from prison, me being in the youth authority, the environment after the riots, it was re re coming back together, everything was burnt down and tore up. So it was a hard time. So she went to that as a way of making money. And that just made it even more special for those visits, for her to get on that bus and go through everything she had to go through to come see me. Now, that was the first red flag our culture shock, our mentality changer. The second one was being in an environment. Now you gotta remember, this goes for prison and these youth authority facilities, they're staffed 
by usually the people in that community. So if you get a facility in the middle of a town that isn't familiar to our style of gangs and violence and pretty much hate it, they're going to demonstrate that type of mentality towards us. Not so only that, they're probably from, all related too. There were so many husband, wives, uncle, mother, cousin, brothers. You're good. Yeah. You're the only person that has ever said that. Yeah. You still coming over this weekend? <laughs> that mentality. Now, not only that, now keep in mind, this is the YA is only 13 institutions. So they have weekly meetings. So the Tupac situation that had just happened, where I had learned later, our facility was the only one participating. It was the little kids. The older facilities didn't even, it was more reminiscent and telling stories about how his music changed them type thing. But that reputation followed us to that institution. So now not only do they not like us based on how our actions are, they don't want that up here, not up here, but also 1996, this woman was killed, one of their brothers-in-law, sister-in-law. So that's also another, animal. let's make sure they don't even think they can do this. So that cultural environment became a whole nother. Now we're going shift to shift. Prior to me coming to this institution though, my mom ended up having an old boyfriend, Bird. Remember Bird, I was talking about Bird and the crib formation, Bird ended up being one of the staff members in Fred C. Nellis, the juvenile 10 through 19 facility. Califani was what he went by there. And he plugged me up to not only go up north, he prepared me for the racial insensitivity is what he called it then. And what to do to do my program and go home. So, Going there, my attention was to go to this fire camp program, which there were only six in the whole institution out of those 13 facilities. So this was a, a privilege. And I took this privilege and went to Paso. I've said this on other videos I've done, like Dusty, American Cholo. I went to this institution with a dude named Loco. Little guy from Corona 13, and he keistered on his way from that Paso, all the way from Nellis to Paso Robles in his rectum, he had, let me see if I can remember his, his inventory list. <laughs> he had tattoo needles up there. Oh my God. He had two lighters, two lighters, a little bit of tattoo ink, some crystal meth, cocaine, marijuana, and rolling papers. He was packing, literally packing. I said he was a little traveling case in the American Cholo video. I laughed when I watched that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> traveling case. <laughs> but I never thought about using that as a way to bring the drugs in. Cause when I was in Nellis, it was in the environment. So my mom could come and throw it over the gate and we retrieve it. That was my way of bringing it in. So I learned, that was where I learned how to keister, what that purpose was, what the rectum was used for the treasure box. <laughs> the little briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> but I disregarded everything, my whole goals and purpose to go up there. This little dude influenced me so much that I ended up trying to get a tattoo, got caught trying to get this tattoo with him tattooing me. We had a couple of my first race riots were there with him and he had prepared me for the first one when we was roommates and told me what was going to happen. Just watch out for me, dog. And I won't hit you. You don't hit me. Like, all right, that's cool, bro. <laughs> but he went to prison for his event because we got caught with the tattoo. He ended up assaulting one of the staff. And she was a Caucasian woman with a black husband, one of the very few black residents of Paso Robles. And he took offense. He didn't like me based on this whole situation. If I wouldn't have been getting this tattoo, 
none of this would have happened. His wife wouldn't have had a black eye. The boy wouldn't have went to prison and all of that. And they purposely sent me to the gang unit where he's one of the staff members there. So I roll up with the, the deck stacked against me. I was supposed to go to fire camp, be going out on the streets and helping society, learning to trade, doing something positive. Now I'm here with some of the most ruthless gang members to where, and it's a shift now. This institution is 16 to about 22. So now you're dealing with a whole different group of individuals and these guys had weights. They had yet to take the weights. That was part of the reform initiative though. They wanted to take away the weights, cigarettes, pornography. The whole institution was shifting while I was sitting here in what they call Woodville because all of the, the uh, racists were known as Woods. So they called that Woodville. And this is where I feel in my story that I began to consider change. Because now my crime that I yet to be caught for involved the Caucasian USC student, a female. And I believe it was one of the most earliest cases of, uh, of a hate crime that wasn't even acknowledged or thought of as a hate crime based on, I didn't even figure it out until afterwards, it was, I was acting out towards women, my hate towards women from my mom's drug abuse, women abandoning me and her being a Caucasian and my father being killed by a Caucasian. It just didn't come together until I received proper counseling. And that's why I'm very understanding of what these children are doing. And that's gonna come in with the new case that's all over YouTube right now. And that 17 year old. So here we are. And speaking of that 17 year old, like I was just saying a different group of individuals. Well, one of those individuals was named Night Owl from A7 Gangster. And his face is everywhere because he's a suspect allegedly for the PNB rock thing. Yeah, the this is where I ran into him. They caught him right here, oh, right down the street from my house. He got caught in Vegas in a different state. Holy shit. Yeah, he got caught yesterday or this morning. I, I seen his pictures up everywhere yesterday. or the Yeah, yesterday I seen him up everywhere. And everybody on YouTube firing off them videos back to back about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just laid a little snippet down. I, I don't like to, what I call culture vulture i don't like to to take advantage of people's relationships that i share with them until i see what everybody else is saying because that gives me an opportunity to judge the real youtubers from the fake youtubers and to be honest out of all the guys that i was in and this can give you kind of a measuring stick of the level of individuals i did 10 years and nine months with if I was to give a list of the top five youth authority offenders, why babies that went home and committed a crime that was like this on this magnitude, I would say this is number five. That shows you how violent some of that is. We got one dude, Sir Mean, that killed four people at a, a bowling alley in Torrance, caught on tape. All white babies. We got a guy, Charlie Baker, nine ball for nine oh, killed the child at Darby Park trying to shoot at my homeboys coming from YA. Days out. So there's been a whole lot of issues. So keeping that in mind, I want the listeners to consider that as I get ready to go back through my 96. I'm not off track, but everything is relevant. But this is a guy who went through the same. If you look at any one of the YouTubers that are white babies, Gunners Collective, who else been a white? It's not very few Black. of us that have. Exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 from uh, Park uh, PJ. All the YA offenders will tell you it's a very bad place. So we get mad at him. People are calling him dirty, Freddy, this dirt bag. How could he have done this? If we demonstrate that much energy 
into the dynamics of the broken home, which like dependence on food stamps, the democratic dream package, food stamps, section eight, uh, be a mother, get rid of the father and we'll take care of you mentality. You gotta be as mad at that. They shouldn't be talking about Tiny Al as much so as they should be talking about the fact that this last administration had people like Tiny Al with the ability to go buy some chains. Not no $100,000 chains, but he could have been like me and got like $3,000 chains. But that being gone and this new administration taking over, trying to erase anything of 44 they can, it triggered this new, not only mentality, but legislation. Illinois purge law, that is scary. Terrifying. Terrifying. Now, keep that in mind, viewers, as we go back to 1996. Let's think about, I want to say I did the research when I was taking my criminal justice degree on the uh, statistic of how many people are in California Department of Corrections prison that were in the youth authority. I want to say it was like, kind of like the recidivism rate. Because when I paroled in 2004, the recidivism rate, if for those that don't know, which is the recorded, the statistical, the, the like a tracking, that's how they track who comes back after leaving youth authority and goes to prison. That's considered the recidivism rate. So if you get out and go to prison, you're part of when I came home, which was a 98%. So now I say that it was 98% of people in prison right now that were where I was at. So this guy that did this crime that we're talking about is a loady, dirt bag, more than likely was somebody who was robbed by a greedy system, the California Youth Authority, that instead of taking that time, see me, I'm part of that 2% because I took the time. The system was supposed to take the time and allure me in to help rehabilitate me with treatment, training, and that type of stuff. These classes that we had like Victims Anonymous, Gangs Awareness, there were teachers selling those certificates because you couldn't make parole in these juvenile facilities without completing these classes. So you get $500 back then in the 90s, to early 2000s for just signing a certificate saying that this dude completed this class. Now, is that Tiny Al, the alleged suspect's fault? Is he a dirtbag because the juvenile facility that was supposed to prepare this guy to not sit around Roscoe's chicken and waffle and look for the next big thing? And another thing I'm going to tell you without getting far off, but I want to get this point out. I do not believe that Al knew who he was. If I was sitting in Roscoe's Chicken and Waffle on September the 12th, 2022, when that dude pulled up in his car, I would have thought he was just like a pimp. That's probably what he was probably got. That's that area, that solicitation area, Broadway, Western, Fig, like all through there, you get those type of people. They probably thought he was a P. Like, oh, we got us one. Yeah, and yeah. I take that in mind to my analysis is P and B underestimated this little guy. 17 year old, think about yourself. I've got kids that age. Are you gonna let your son take your jury? <laughs> this no. is what I honestly <laughs> believe happened. And now with my crime, for those that didn't see the other parts, I actually shot somebody in a similar situation. Funny thing, I was around the corner from, this is why everybody say, you should have went to the Roscoe's Chicken and Waffle on Gower. Well, if you research my crime and see where it took place, right around, we passed the Roscoe's Chicken. I remember in, when I committed my crime, July 11, 1994, after shooting two Caucasian USC students, I was evading the scene as the police were coming and we were passing Roscoe's chicken and waffles as they was coming. I remember the blurs cause I'm high and intoxicated. 
but I remember the lights shining, coming to try to find me as Roscoe's illuminated in the background. And I say that to say, no matter where he would have went because of the situation that is created by broken homes, the uh, contributing factors, the, the people that brought drugs here from a country we had no way to just go to Colombia and get, these are the elements that created those hungry people in that parking lot. And we want to turn it around on the victim and make him bad for wanting to support one of the only black owned chicken and waffle establishments. We're not going to say, oh, he's wrong for he want to go support, take a picture and get put on the wall like all these other people that we've never criticized for doing so. So now back to 1996, there was something proven that you can Google since we're all going to be Googling what I just talked about there. You can Google and Paso Robles is called the Mary C. Romero Youth Training Youth Facility. They had a program to where they were trying to de-escalate racism. Like I said, when I first rode up with Loco, we went from having that conversation to where it went off limits. Like the, the whole mentality in that younger facility, Fred C. Nellis, was a whole different environment with these 16 to 22 year olds. It was more racist. So what they would do is if there was a race riot, they would send us to the, um, what's that called? The gym, like where you go play basketball. Now keep in mind what that floor feel like, how many burns you got on that floor playing ball. We've all experienced yeah. that. If you play some ball, they put us on that floor. Paso Robles is central coast, gets real cold and real foggy up there. So they purposely, there's no, you can't sleep past 15 minutes because the whole time you sleep, you're handcuffed. So now imagine three days with handcuffs not being taken off. I heard the record was six. Mine oh. is four with Holy handcuffs shit. on. They would take us and put us at least this close to the Hispanic individuals we just battled. Some of us will have scars, hurt feelings, <laughs> emotions, and anger. And they would sit there all day, have us do that. Until when the time to sleep came, they would put a mattress out. That's why you know you couldn't sleep over 15 minutes because every 15 minutes, by law, they said, they had to check our uh, respiration, like, if the things weren't killing our circulation. So the lady, the nurse would come check on us. But that is the mentality that we get from the suspect, alleged suspect of this shooting. He comes from that same broken theory, broken institution. That broken institution is what I believe is contributing to a number of Los Angeles events. This is where I got a second chance going to that gang unit. And unbelievingly, it occurred when they started to make the, the living unit I was on at the time was called Napomo. So I went from the, the in, intake unit where I got caught doing the tattoo, Arroyo, to the gang unit, Napomo, instead of Los Robles Fire Camp. You can see it, it's on its own grounds. I would look at where I was and I set that as my goal. If I go over here to this gang unit where everybody like the guy I met, Tiny Al, the alleged dude, with that mentality, if I go over there and don't go that way, I can make it to fire camp. And that became the goal. And that's what I did. Start going to Bible study, prayer sessions, and got my way there. Earned my way to fire camp. Nice. And this is for the younger kids. Like that 17 year old that had idolized his father that much. I've went over so many different contributors to my involvement or victimization of Lisa LaPierre. That's my victim that I shot. Condolences to her family. And I want to put out there without snitching, and it's the homie that I was with. And we're going to say this, I say this not to be snitching because I'm not saying this to criminalize it, but I'm saying this to 
dynamically break it down in a psychological perspective is I wanted this dude who I was with, my co-offender, who I won't even mention, but he's in California death row right now. So my admiration and like he was my dad. He took care of me when my mom was in prison doing those drugs. So to impress him, I would do anything. And like PNB Rock underestimating this dude, in my opinion, this isn't anything I've read anywhere or heard anywhere, but I believe he saw this little kid like, bro, you have to kill me before you get this little dude. And there was two reasons why that trigger was pulled. In my opinion, that little dude was scared that his weapon would get took. And that's coming, I don't know if he drew first or not, but even knowing this dude could attack me because he's a man and I'm a child and take my gun and kill me, that fear aspect, which if I was the defense attorney like Johnny Cochran would fight on, it was that or he wanted to be like I did. You know, when I went to go rob the woman, I said, give me your phone and put my hand with the gun in the car. And she rolled up her window. And I tried to move my hand out and boom, the gun went off and I accidentally shot her. I think he was trying to scare this man. He didn't want to kill this dude in front of that child. 17 year old, you can easily, like a psychologist, I've taken, I got two A's and two different types of psychology, one-on-one and uh, uh, anthropology psychology. So I could pretty much psychoanalyze what an individual is thinking at 17 years old. There's still room for remorse. There's still room for sympathy. You clearly know that you don't want somebody to come do this to you and your family. So I would not go on the assumption of thinking, and I would love to be like on the stand on his defense, given my analyzation from an educational and experience perspective that I don't think he had what qualifies for 187. And that's that intent to kill. Not just because of the age. There are some 17-year-olds that really are killers, and he might be that. But hopefully for the sake of the world, that wasn't his goal, because I've seen many people in my 10 years like this. So I'm at fire camp now. And these are the type of things, seeing individuals who raised that little kid, not wanting to be like them, and on my first day, after all the, the guy with the traveling case, getting six months for the gang-related tattoo, going to a gang-related union, unit, it taught me nothing. Because I went on my first day, when they called me, they said, hey, guy, congratulations. And who really signed the ticket was Miss Sharon, who got socked. When she came to the unit with her husband, and he had told her how I've been programming, cleaning up after myself, being respectful. She like uh, uh, accepted my apology and vouched for me going to that fire camp unit. And That's she solid. actually was the one, she told me, like she wanted to tell me, congratulations, you're moving on. She seen it in you. She recognized that you could do better. And you proved it obviously that you could. Yeah, the proof was in the work. And guess what age I was? That was 14. I was 17 now. Oh, I see. 14, I did the shooting. Juvenile Hall, I turned 15. California Youth Authority in Nellis, I turned 16 with the Paso, and I turned 17 right when I got there. So I'm the same age as that little dude. And look what I do. Keeping in mind all of that good self-esteem building experiences. I should have went over there with my Bible in my hand, giving them people praises for uplifting and encouraging me, right? <laughs> no, the Inglewood mentality. There's a guy, I'm not gonna name him, but he fell out of favor with the Bloods, the Inglewood Bloods especially, and he was no good no more. So I took the opportunity me of going to make money in fire camp because they get paid every day, whether you're on a fire or not, they give you a job called grades. You was getting paid. I go in this guy's locker and take his shoes and his walk. First day going to fire camp. 
this facility is 17. You got to be 17 to 25 to be in this institution. And most of these kids have really earned their way there. En route, I met some new individuals that were coming from the intake unit and going there, some older guys. And they had actually come from YTS the most where the lady had gotten killed. So for them to come and I immediately bragging, trying to earn, I just bagged up this pump. You know, he tried to be hard from Inglewood. I showed him that you can't claim the city and do that. I took his walk, man. And I embarrassed myself trying to earn some respect and, and got lost respect. When they explained to me like, bro, if you ain't gonna take it from a man face first and foremost, you leaving, that's gonna be perceived as a buster move. Like, oh, I ain't think about that. Then second of all, if you're trying to go over here to change and grow up, you coming already with the wrong mentality. And we coming up here and don't want that over here, little bro. And I'm like, damn, reality check. So before I even made it in the door, I had made up my mind to let them know I accidentally brought some stuff that didn't belong to me. I ain't telling them I went over there and stole nothing. Now this is a real, it's for my youngsters that are out there hungry and your only example is a father that you're so wanting to prove yourself to that you're willing to rob and kill for. Think about what you could do if you become the example. This became my thinking. Cause I'm like, Nellis got that rap for being little bad kids. Why babies is what, that's where the name came from. No staff and pass all that racism, you little white babies. That's where I kept the name from. I didn't want to be that. I want to be known as the firefighter Frank, the honest, trustworthy person. So I went in and as soon as I got there, I said, sir, before we get in and there be any misunderstanding, I forgot to give my buddy back his property. I was so excited to get over here and I left it in my bag and I just wanted to return it before they thought I stole it or anything like that. Here it go. And to my favor, that worked. But what it also did is it changed my life because when they called to report this, they talked to Miss Sharon, the lady who was stalked by Loco, the lady who went through all that, me being punked and having to man up to be accepted by, they talked to her. There's cameras in this. Every institution now has cameras everywhere. Since that Miss Baker incident mandated state, that was before we got off lockdown. Cameras and M numbers and F numbers, all the dope commitments gone. So they looked at the camera. Remember, I forgot I left the shoes from visiting. I was listening to it. And oh, they seen me. <laughs> Appropriating this, it. <laughs> man. Now, I would have thought this lady would have threw me under the bus. Bring him back. He's a failure. No. She didn't say nothing to them. But later on came back and let me know. This is how I know they seen the cameras. She told me, she said, you know you're here because of me. What you mean, Miss Shirley? You took his can, you took that and did that. Oh, you seen that. But that was like, to me, I didn't know it yet then. After growing more, going to college, getting a degree, I now know that was my first. Remember, I say my crime was hate crime based on the Caucasian police shot my father, and this was somebody showing me that racism wasn't all, all people of a race. There are certain bad seeds amongst all of us. And it's up to us to judge those people by their character and not like Dr. King would say, the content of their skin. So she let me ride it out. And thanks to her, and my efforts that I earned by not being an asshole going up there, learning from my mistakes and not giving up after making a bad decision, I got to camp. Marshmallows with the fire, the freedom to see the streets. I worked the Yosemite fire, like one of the biggest fires in national park history and felt like a new man. 
like when she told you that she saw and and you knew that that you're there because of her did you feel any kind of guilt afterwards or like like sh maybe not shame but this is sad but it's a learning experience for others it helps you see the mentality of gang entrenched 17 that's how i should have off the bat and probably if that would have been my mind state the next topic I'm about to go on would have never happened. But no, I felt sexually attracted. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. If I have the intention on teaching, I'm this little 17 year old dude. ain't had none since I was 14. I'm like, oh, she want me. That's why she <laughs> kept it hush hush. This is flirting. Immature. <laughs> Immature. Even with Bird sending me up there. I should have instantly felt bad. Like he sent me to this whole institution just to go to fire camp and I want to get a tattoo. But I was like, no, he know he understand. He know justification. I was using all of these bad elements and contributors to try to make myself think that what I was doing was understandable. Justification. Justification and minimization. Yep. Things that you usually are asked about in parole board. And this takes us to June 16, 1997. I rode up to fire camp in November of 96. So I've been there about five, six months. I'm comfortable. My property is big. I've got money on my books. They tell me I get a, a consideration for early parole. I gave it no second thoughts. A chance to go home? Let's run this. So June 16th was my hearing, 2000, I mean, 1997. I would be getting out in the height of the Tupac aftermath because what happened in Vegas ended up transferring over to Compton. 26 people involved in that Tupac situation are no longer with us. And some of my homies were robbing banks at the time. That's all I really knew. Because now remember, based on the influence of WAC 100 and Juvenile Hall, I was now a member of Crenshaw Mafia instead of the Money Side Hustler crew, which were now under the influence of, what's that movie? Set It Off. They was robbing banks. They still took care of me, though. And I still acknowledge my membership from this Money Side Hustler crew. But when it comes to gang banging, I've crushed all my feet. I knew coming home, I had intentions on utilizing my certificate I earned because we really get trained through the real Department of Forestry, which is a certification that could be utilized. I'm a fireman. So I'm giving up all of that was my thought on June 16th, 1997. Parole board asked me a couple of questions and said, you're free to go, you're parole, you can now go home. I had been in jail since 94, 97. I was working on four years at the time. Yes, but before I could get out the door, before I could even make it out the, once I walked out that room, they were right there saying, hello, we've been looking for you. This is when I had to accept responsibility for my actions on June 14th, 1994. And Frank, on our last episode, we never even got into Lisa. We, uh, we didn't get the story out. I did that intentionally. Oh, in all the my cliffhanger. Other interviews, Gotta leave I it. always went through the whole story. Then it would get confusing when I ended up in jail. And then June came along and I'm like, hold on, now? Now everything comes out. When I got paroled, the crime that I got paroled for worked this way from attempted murder, which was a stabbing at a high school that I talked about. That is what sent me to why, stabbing a gang rival who became later a friend. And I first beat a fitness hearing, which was a requirement right now, which 
a lot of people don't know. I see YouTubers saying, we're going to see if he gets tried as an adult or not, the 17-year-old alleged suspect. Automatically in California, under that great uh, Pete Wilson law, 14-year-old, when they turned the age to 14, murder, it's no consideration. Like, how they consider, like, can I be real? Murder, you automatically go to adult court. And then adult court may or may not consider your age. My case was so complicated. First of all, like I said, when I got that early parole, I wasn't supposed to parole in June because of the tattoo, gang-related tattoo incident. So I didn't because I thought it was just normal to get a seven-month time cut. No, they were trying to put the case together at the same time preserving their rights to charge me. I didn't know at that time I had to think. No, first of all, I did, I thought they were coming to serve me with a gang injunction because the Crenshaw Mafia gang in 1997 had the gang injunction. So all the other members that were going home, like Lil Dockett just went home, he had to sign some papers saying he won't go over there or face a felony. So I thought that was what this was about when this officer met me at the door. So as we're walking, he went to buy me a soda out the vending machine. And he said, if I didn't say, you know, I'm a Hollywood homicide detective. Hollywood homicide detective. Like, what the hell? That ain't got nothing doing no gang injunction. And I know what I did in Hollywood, which was with Lisa. So now before we get into the criminal proceedings, I like to break down what mentally, physically, and the aftermath of her incident. And like I said, it happened in July of 94. As I spoke on lightly in the other videos is that from 92 after the riots shifted a lot of big homies to prison, there was a lack of leadership. And us littler gangs like Money Side Hustlers and the Tag Banger crews started to overwhelm the streets and look for that reputation that the Crips and Bloods had. Robbing, shooting, those type of things happened. Now, I wasn't in Hollywood with the attention to her harm physically, shoot anyone. Totally robbery was what was on our mind, me and my co-offender. So to help you understand the influence, he was 23 and I was 14. He was a moneymaker, known blood through the neighborhood. And I idolized and looked up to the home. What was used in court documentations, they say that he was the predator using us little kids to commit his crime. Now, I was just as much as a wolf as anybody out there. And everything that I was doing was on my own omission. Not, I can't, he cannot be criminally penalized because I looked up to him so much I wanted to prove myself. No, that's not gonna work. This is my story now. I can't be, everything happened before I was able to be tried as an adult. So everything I'm saying now is I'm protected by law. But at the same time, I believe that my co-offender who now sits on death row was wrongfully prosecuted. So I'm gonna gingerly speak on his influence, if any. And like I said, it mainly was all from a self-esteem perspective, more as not an instructional, you go do this. That's what they got twisted. And 16, 17, 14, I didn't know how to explain that. I quickly realized, like I said, once I seen this was Hollywood, what was going on, but that was only uh, the beginning of it. Since I go into this room, he takes me into, it was a conference room, big conference room. And they were, I see ATF jacket, FBI jacket. I'm like, what the hell? Oh no. They came there to intimidate. Because little do I know that there's an a, a unsolved murder. But this dude was at a car wash and he got robbed and killed. And they incarcerated, tried, and convicted a Latino transgender prostitute. Hear that? 
arrested. So that means investigated, arrested, tried, and convicted. And I was there. This happened on June, no, July the 4th, the day all the things go boom. 1994, with the same exact gun that I shot Lisa LaPierre with, case is still unsolved. But they wanted to know who did that. They wanted to know whether these people that was telling on me did it or I did it. So, you know, they put the good cop, bad cop, federal, the coldest intimidation factor technique they could come with at a 17-year-old. I'm surprised they didn't have a Navy SEAL in the room. And a damn canine. I Jeez. said that before. <laughs> <laughs> But you see what else they did to add to that incentive, incentivism, is they made me also put my freedom on. I need I needed seven more months, but in seven more months, they couldn't try me based on they had filed the case already. So the DA only has so much time without them having to go through something. They would have to let me go home. So all of that in mind was my first test in, I wouldn't say first test, because when I stabbed the guy and was facing being tried as an adult, and they told me if I told who was the other individuals that helped me jump this dude out of high school that I wouldn't be tried as adult mandatory, I ain't jump on that. So that was my first time facing some pressure. But this pressure was more so because what they didn't know, I wanted to know who was telling them. They was playing games like the first 48. Well, your buddy that's in jail right now, he gave it all up. <laughs> like, <laughs> it got tricky, especially when they start talking about, well, you know, you could go home right now. Just tell us who all this was just somebody and they just putting it all on you. They, op- they put the door there. And that's the difference for you youngsters with the law is they can lie, but they can't coerce intimidate or are paid even though they do that a lot they do that that that's how they got my information i swear (laughs) yeah i know they do that a lot but they're not supposed to Mm -mm. but they tried they even tried that one they tried that one we'll let you get out relocate your mother Do, do 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 we just don't think that you at 14 years old are capable of doing such a horrific crime. You might have been there. So, four hour drive to get to Paso because my mom was getting a ride to come pick me up. And I was still talking to the police. By the time she came, found out what happened to me and got back home. So nine hours they had me. Interrogation. You were in that room with all of them for nine hours? They were all there for individual purposes. Like, everybody, first of all, was trying to say that my big homie, who's on death row, was involved in all of their cases. Like, he provided the guns. He told y'all what banks to hit. He took y'all to the licks. Like, they all were trying to back up. I, I seen that off the bat. That was easy. And I knew I wasn't going home. I had admitted this crime to my mom and right after I'd done it. And I told her then that, cause she was on drugs. So I was trying to do like a guilt trip. I caught her in a dope house. Like, listen, I shot this woman in Hollywood. So we both in tears. You feel me? I had to put the pistol on the table. Like, you know, I'm willing to give all this up. If you go get clean and I'll go turn myself in for shooting that lady. Cause I felt bad because all my other victims had been gang related. I wasn't a predator of innocent individuals or racially motivated crimes. It was always, that's my enemy. If I don't get him, he's going to get me mentality. So it hit different shooting this woman. So the night it happened, it was mutual is the best way to put it. Whereas they try to say he uh, uh, recruited me. (laughs) No. I was there, he was there in Hollywood, opportunity arose, and I took it upon myself to get involved. 